Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience in holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically anytime using the Q&A pod located to the left of your webinar platform. You may also download a copy of today's presentation using the resources pod located directly below the Q&A pod. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's first presenter, AJ moderator, John Rigi. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is John Rigi on behalf of the American Hospital Association. Welcome. Uh, I'm your national advisor for cybersecurity and risk here at the AHA. And we here at the AHA hope you are safe and well, and thank you for your organization's outstanding care and dedication to the patients of your community. I'm pleased to be hosting today's educational program entitled Virtual Desktop Infrastructure, VDI, Impact on Patient Care, How VDIs Improve Cybersecurity, Compliance, and Employee Retention. This presentation and discussion is brought to you through the generous support of Tetherview organization. Reducing IT footprint is a critical step in succeeding in the battle against cyber threats and compliance requirements. In a healthcare organization, implementing desktop technology will provide secure, compliant, and convenient remote access that helps boost employee productivity and improve patient care. It enables an easy to access, consistent experience across multiple devices and locations. In a hospital and healthcare setting, clinicians are mobile, moving from one patient to another. VDI support enhanced user mobility and remote access by providing a standardized desktop that can be reached from almost anywhere in almost any approved and compliant endpoint. These virtual desktops contain a full range of virtual apps and data and can eliminate the need for physical dedicated desktops while reducing login times and password requirements. So for today's discussion, I'm proud to be joined by my friend and colleague, Michael Abood, CEO at Tetherview, who will provide an in-depth examination of how virtual desktops address cybersecurity compliance, and employee retention within a hospital setting, while also providing benefits for both patients and staff. Michael, before we begin, how about just a few words on your unique background and how you came to develop the virtual desktop? Thanks, John. Well, first, thank you for hosting. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be part and, and working around the American Hospital Association. I had the privilege of attending the uh, conference in D.C. a few weeks ago. Um, and it was truly um, a great event, lots of thought leadership, and, and the advocacy, advocacy amongst the members is, is, um, is unprecedented anywhere in any other organizations I've been with. But um, you know, John and I were, were talking prior to um, the, the webinar here, and I was just explaining some of my background and how Tetherview came to be. Um, prior to being in IT and IT services and IT security, I was in healthcare technology, um, specifically in the radiology world. Um, and I've done everything you can imagine with an MRI, um, you know, taking them apart, put them back together, joint ventured with many um, um, university hospitals, including Georgetown University, Montefiore Medical Center, uh, just to name a few. And throughout my, my um, stint in the healthcare world, um, I had a very fragmented IT infrastructure that I was managing. And um, as I was preparing to exit from the radiology world, um, we had built an IT infrastructure for ourselves and our partners um, that revolved around virtual desktop and quickly recognized that this is a great solution and, and knew this was where I was going. So the genesis of Tetherview really comes from the need of, of practitioners in healthcare, recognizing the challenges that healthcare providers have um, beyond other commercial operations. Um, so yeah, Tetherview is, is, is started out as a thought around healthcare technology and providing better patient care and better patient outcomes for, for our partners. I appreciate that, Michael. So you're not just a cyber vendor. You actually grew up in the healthcare industry. You understand the challenges and unique needs that we have in healthcare. And before we launch into the substance, I want to let the audience know really on some of the topics that we'll be discussing today. So we'll hear from Michael what virtual desktops are and how they differ from traditional PCs, how virtual desktops significantly improve security posture, how virtual desktops can enhance compliance, 
and how virtual desktops may increase employee happiness. We need a lot of that in healthcare these days. Employee retention, massive workforce shortage, and better patient outcomes, because that's job one. Take care of patients, provide the best outcome possible, and save lives. So folks that are listening in, tuning in today, we've allocated some time for your questions, so feel free to submit questions through the Q&A portal at any time. Note, too, that you can easily download the presentation through the resource section on your webinar screen. So again, this is John Regi, your National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk. Thanks again, Michael, uh, for being here with us today. So let's get right to it. Talk to me about virtual desktops. What's the difference between a virtual desktop and a traditional PC? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, and um, there's a lot of confusion around that, too, even amongst highly technical folks. So the, the uh, quick answer, a virtual desktop is what it sounds like. It's a virtualized instance of a desktop that's not running on local infrastructure or a local computer. So when you log into your Windows machine, you're using resources at your, your virtual desktop provider's uh, data center or data centers. Um, the, 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 the other nuance here for virtual desktops is a lot of folks have been using remote desktop protocol, um, Citrix receiver, and others very similar technologies. But the distinguishing factor and a really big, big, big distinguishing part of virtual desktops is no data ever persists locally at the mm -hmm. device, not even in memory. So PHI, when you download that data, when you're looking at that radiology image, when you're reviewing anything that contains sensitive PHI, you literally could be at a stranger's computer on a Starbucks Wi-Fi, and none of that data will reside ever in memory or ever touch the local device. Interesting. So interesting. So obviously lots of advantages there regardless of, you know, whatever service or solution, but the concept we hear a lot about it, especially in this remote world, uh, after the pandemic. We're, obviously, the pandemic caused a tremendously uh, significant acceleration of a remote dispersed workforce, third parties, and, and rush to cloud services, uh, again, mainly due to the workforce issue. So let's talk about that. How do you think that the virtual desktop impacts workforce issues? Yeah, it impacts it in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and I like to look work backwards, and, and, and the mission of a hospital or any healthcare provider, as we talked about earlier, is patient outcomes. Okay. And good patient outcomes start with um, effective healthcare providers having access to data everywhere, um, and then not frustrating providers as they're trying to access their data. Um, so virtual desktops impact the workforce by really providing prolific access to your data your patient data from everywhere, any device, um, and it really allows you to, to provide services anywhere you go. The, the tangent of that, as all organizations are struggling with workforce and, and hiring and employee retention, is virtual desktops allow you to access resources around the globe um, to provide your services without having to worry that data is uh, residing on a local device, without having to worry if the internet connection is compromised, or even having to worry if the local physical device is compromised, the risk is going to be mitigated significantly. Interesting. So again, right, the, the, the impact on the workforce is it allows you to recruit anywhere in the world um, and recruit not just full time. So if you are, you know, telemedicine obviously has had a big growth during, right. during the pandemic. And one of the challenges in telemedicine, specifically around mental health issues, is finding providers. Right. Um, and unfortunately, in rural settings, providers are, are scarce, more scarce than they are anywhere else. Um, so, and you know, you, you think about a critical care facility where you have a patient that's coming in um, and they're having, you know, an issue. And you might not have the specific specialist on staff. But with telemedicine, it allows you to reach out literally anywhere in the globe who's licensed to practice in your state, obviously, um, who has access to your medical records, and bring in that, that highly trained specialist for that one patient or those couple of patients that come in a week. Um, so again, virtual desktops impact the workforce because it allows you to provide better services by hiring specialists around specific areas who you might not have a full-time full, full demand, full demand. Right. 
Well, we already see that phenomenon occurring, especially during the pandemic. There was an increased use of telehealth. Some of those uh, exceptions that have been made for telehealth during the pandemic, I believe, will become permanent, or if not, have already become permanent. Uh, we do see the, the pooling of these remote uh, clinicians now, for instance, radiologists. We know that many, many smaller organizations do not have radiologists on site, so they they uh, they use remote imaging services, and uh, so obviously if that radiologist can have a virtual desktop tied to that specific hospital for their own workstation, um, that will make things, I think, even more efficient. Uh, clearly, you talk about the security piece. Obviously, as National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk, you and I had lots of discussions about that. Tell me how secure it is. I don't want to hear just how good it is. I want to understand how secure it is. And I, I did put, even Michael and I have been friends for a long time, but bottom line is I represent the hospitals of America, and we want to make sure that anybody that sits in this chair next to me um, is worthy of presenting a secure solution. So not an endorsement. We're just going to talk about um, your services there. But, again, on the workforce piece, I can't stress enough how important that is. You, you mentioned this. You expand your potential workforce environment to the entire globe. And no data, once they disconnect, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that the virtual desktop, through whatever solution, no data resides on the endpoint after the disconnection. Correct. If, you're, if you build a true virtual desktop experience, um, you're not using any resources locally. So there's something called a zero client, mm -hmm. which essentially has very little compute power locally and is just keyboard, video, and mouse. Um, so there's not even the ability for you to save something locally. Um, but if you're using a, 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 an old Mac, mm -hmm. right, which which everyone thinks is impenetrable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but let's say you're using an old machine that's not exactly um, meet the standards that your organization would like you to be working from. Again, we mitigate that risk because we're not bringing the machine locally. Um, the way the cloud was built was a hack. The cloud was designed to bring data to everyone everywhere, mm -hmm. okay? And from a practical perspective, if we live in a utopian world, which we don't, unfortunately, right. that's great, right? I can work from everywhere, and I have everything at my fingertips. Um, but because we have to worry about security, because we have to worry about um, uh, patient health information, um, it's not practical. So what virtual desktops do is the opposite of what the cloud does. Instead of bringing the data to the users, you're bringing the users to the data. Wow. I think that's really enlightening. And I think that, that statement really resonates with me and perhaps with lots of our viewers. Again, you're bringing the user to the data, right? So the data is staying in the United States, correct? We'll talk a little bit about more about the security, again, like my favorite subject, of course. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, when a hospital client health system is subjected to an attack. And they might have a combination of regular standardized, desktops, on-prem solutions, their own networks, and these virtual desktops. And unfortunately, folks, you all know we have seen many high-impact ransomware attacks that require the immediate disconnection of the internal network and then the uh, disconnection from the Internet. So what, what happens in a situation like that when a client needs to lock down the network for whatever reason? But unfortunately, we've seen there's a ransomware attacks. Yeah, it's a great it's a great scenario um, to kind of walk through. So there's two there's two good uses for virtual desktop. First is in production, every day, using it every day. Um, and I'll I'll get into to the benefits there. And then the second option for virtual desktop is a term that we've actually trademarked called standby virtual desktop. Hmm. And what and so the standby virtual desktop you go to that as part of your emergency plan. Okay. And so, but to answer your question, John, what happens when the hospital has to isolate? Right. Okay, so you have a big healthcare system that has um, an outlying or one of their, one of their satellite facilities that gets, that gets breached. Right. Um, and you want to isolate the network. Well, with virtual desktop, you're not tied to any specific internet connection. In fact, the way we encourage folks to design a virtual desktop infrastructure is to make it as prolific as possible to eliminate any single point of failure. So again, if you have to lock down the network, and we, we know that you know, uh, the Main Street facility has been breached, okay, but we don't think it's, it's hit everywhere else, we can take Main Street offline, people go onto their virtual desktops while they're in Main Street, 
using their cell phone hotspots or a publicly broadcasted Wi-Fi right. to access their virtual desktops. Right. And instead of depending on hard, um, and I'm sorry, I use technical term VPNs from the one facility back to a single another facility, very hard connection. You might have redundancy there, but if you're breached, you've got to cut that off. That's right. Right? And so virtual desktops allow you to get to the network from lots of different places. Right. The other thing cool about virtual desktops is we can camouflage where they where they're hosted very easily. We can move them around and we can we can change things very much on the fly. So in the event of a breach, you know, we've all got amazing manuals and every hospital in the country is well trained and we have, you know, resources and, and we prepare for everything. But sometimes you need to be nimble because unlike a fire, which is defined by the laws of physics, right? Um, cybersecurity is defined by defined, the, the adversary on the other side of our cybersecurity world. They're, they're divine, defined by, you know, motivations, and they're smart. They're smarter than most of these folks are smarter than, than, than the cybersecurity guys, unfortunately, sitting behind the desk, and we, we have to stay ahead. Yeah. No, I, I agree. So, you know, as folks know out there that one of the first uh, remediation steps during the ransomware attack is, again, got to disconnect from the Internet, a couple of reasons. One, you want to disconnect the potential avenue for command and control, basically for the bad guys halfway around the world. If they're ransomware, primarily Russian-speaking, that's my editorial comment, meaning provided safe harbor by the Russian government, um, giving instructions for that ransomware to detonate. So you want to block that off, but also we've seen these double-layered extortion-type attacks where they're exfiltrating data. The way to prevent that is you have to disconnect from the Internet. So when I've responded to some of these ransomware attacks, we talk about how do they access their data. So the data is sitting there. It's just the, the pipe that is disconnected. So if this type of solution that allows for, again, a mobile hotspot, guest access, Wi-Fi sometimes, which are not, which are network segmented, probably might be another avenue around that. So we're talking about how the virtual desktop environment post-breach has a number of advantages, depending upon what data is stored there. What about, what about pre-breach? What about pre-breach? How does this add to security? Again, I'm very concerned about when we have folks logging in, what data will they access? How do you ensure that users don't have broad access within that virtual environment, too, when they, when they log in? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I want to I wanna describe the ideal situation for a cybersecurity person. It's an environment where it's fully whitelisted, right? So no action is happening inside your environment that you or management have not made a decision, right? And what is cybersecurity, and I'm, I'm going to steal John's words here, it's risk mitigation, right? Right. And, and so if we can give every user the same exact PC with the same patches, mm. with the same environment, and think about during a breach, if we can shut the network down, but maybe we only shut down X, X outbound internet, okay? And so your users are, again, are working from a whitelisted type of environment. So, so what happens is um, during that breach, right, the user comes in, um, they're, they're on their virtual desktop, and again, we want to encourage healthcare facilities especially to work towards this whitelist type of approach, right, where users are only working on data accessing internet that you whitelist, applications that you whitelist, so there's less trouble that can happen. The other nice thing about virtual desktops when done properly is in the middle of the day, we can patch for anything in the middle of the production day, roll that out to your thousands of users without impacting production. Trust. Simple log on and log off. Um, in my world where I sit, my perspective of cybersecurity, the biggest risk is unpatched machines and zero-day vulnerabilities and uh, known exploited vulnerabilities. And they're coming everywhere. I mean, these, the software vendors are, again, a software vendor's objective is to provide a productivity suite. Right. You know, even as an EMR provider, unfortunately, your number one job is to provide an EMR software that's that's great, accessible, user friendly. Security is an obstacle, and you have to you have to kind of build that in. 
But that's just that's the that's the tug, the, the pull back and forth. Right. So again, with virtual desktops, we can cut off the internet, we can whitelist it, um, but more importantly, we can patch in the middle of the day um, and get ahead of of these of these vulnerabilities before they propagate through your network. Right. So let's, let's talk to me a little bit about what type of applications you're hosting. Is this just Office 365? Is it the electronic medical record? What can be hosted on a virtual desktop? Is it is it imaging type software? Yeah, I mean the the again the ideal situation for a virtual desktop deployment is that it reduces your IT footprint significantly. Mm -hmm. So instead of having you know a, a browser based session for something, a remote desktop for something else, you want your users to work 100% from inside this virtual desktop. They're going to do everything from there. They're going to do their Teams meetings. They're going to do their their web their web presentations. They're going to access their EMR. They're going to access their um, uh, teleradiology systems, right. um, and they're going to do everything inside that virtual desktop. So, as an IT provider, as the IT um, leader in an organization, you have the ultimate control of, of these machines. If you are still if you're managing physical desktops, it's almost impossible to roll out a patch in the middle of the day. It's a process. You've got to create windows. You've got to turn machines off. There's reboots required. It's a process to patch, and it's almost impossible to stay ahead of um, the patch game today. Right. So your virtual desktop, basically any application that would be normally physically or loaded onto the servers, on-prem servers, on the desktop, you would be able to, you or any virtual desktop provider would have them. The theory is on this virtual desktop up in the cloud and uh, within your facilities there. Um, so from there, let's say they access the electronic medical record, which is then hosted uh, in the cloud. It could be in a cloud by a third-party provider. Right, right. So ultimately, again, the gateway to path is within a virtual desktop, but it would function just as a regular standalone endpoint would uh, within the pot on-prem, within the environment. So, so let's talk about, all right, it all sounds great, right? It, so you get the virtual desktop environment there, but how do we, as you know, I speak about risk, how can we be ensured that we're not just transferring risk? Again, not just for your solution, any solution that we would look at on virtual desktop, right? So we talk about resiliency. Are we, how can we be assured we're not just transferring local risk up to the cloud on the environment, the virtual desktop? Like, let's talk about the resilience. In your own, your own environment, redundancy, network segmentation, all these things we talk about for hospitals to have in place on-prem. How do you address those issues? Yeah, so first, don't trust anyone, <laughs> right? <laughs> you must know me well. So. <laughs> um, you, you shouldn't trust anyone, and, right. and, and there should be multiple layers. Create, you know, in, in a, speaking objectively from a virtual desktop ex experience and a right. provider, what you're looking for is a zero-trust solution, okay? And I think, my opinion, is that virtual desktops get us the closest to a zero-trust environment than any other solution out there today and that we see in the foreseeable future. So can, so, you, can you explain that a little further? Tell me, tell me how, how can you make such a definitive statement yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, so let's go back to our, our workforce challenges that every, every organization has. Um, you know, and the bigger your organization, the more challenging it becomes. You have a position that's open and you don't have a lot of applicants. You get an applicant in there, they pass the background check, you go through all of the right steps and let's say they don't show up on Monday after they fill out all the paperwork on Friday and maybe you gave them network credentials and maybe even shipped them a laptop. That's, that's not a fun situation. And according to the, I used to think that my organizations that I'm involved with were, were special and we were the only ones experienced that. And then the Wall Street Journal and New York Times um, published articles saying that 10% during the height of the pandemic 10% of folks that accepted a job did not show up on Monday. Um, the other risk associated to that is the person quits on Tuesday. So, so the virtual desktop kind of builds that zero trust model because I can cut them off in one single location versus if they have a laptop that we have to get back or maybe, maybe they've had the laptop for a period of time and data resides on it locally. You can't wipe the laptop unless it gets back on the network. Yeah. So you can communicate to it. So if the user downloaded things locally to their laptop or they emailed them things, their self, their self data, or they, they were able to get a USB key around, around the situation, virtual desktops mitigate that. So we, 
approach virtual desktops as a zero trust situation. And we don't even want our clients to trust us. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but you know, and then we can, we can talk about resiliency a little bit. Yeah, so, but let me go back again to the zero trust. The, quite frankly, the, the issue of the insider threat, although possible, happens not the major threat we're facing. So in zero trust, it's really stolen credentials from a legitimate employee that are used to then access identity access management, especially if you, know, you have an employee that doesn't show up, okay, comes fairly obvious, disable their credentials. But the, um, uh, depending on what data they have, but it's those stolen credentials, right, that movement, that principle of least privilege, uh, of least privileged access that, you know, that I'm also we're most concerned about because besides the phishing emails, it is those stolen credentials that represent one of the most significant vulnerability, generally attached to it as a result of a phishing email. Um, so how, again, how would you manage that? Is it the organizations, cybersecurity folks that would manage identity and access management? Um, would they work in conjunction with the virtual desktop provider? How, tell me, explain a little bit about that as well. Yeah, so um, something I've, I've, I'm, we're working on the data here, but um, virtual desktops make great cybersecurity tools much more effective because they don't have to work as hard. So to answer your question about the stolen credentials, how does a virtual desktop work? Well, first, the, the organization needs to have the least privileged kind of model established, and the organization is always defining who has the access to what, right. okay? But a good virtual desktop solution with all the proper tools that built properly and engineered at an enterprise grade with you know, military-grade security and, and banking and healthcare-grade compliance creates a situation where the user can only work from that virtual desktop. So even if I have your credentials, all right, and let's say I have your EMR credentials, which unfortunately a lot of this happens, right? People use their Netflix password for their email. There's nothing we can do about that. It could be the most complex email password, but Netflix is a honeypot, and I'm not picking on Netflix. The Netflix CEO said that. We do not care about passwords. They said for a moment in time, part of their business model is to keep people on the platform and get the views and the eyes on. Well, so, fortunately, we've got a lot of hospitals. They force password change every 90 days and so forth. But let's assume that the, yeah. they're, they're changing their Netflix password contemporaneously with, yeah. with, with the email because I want to have the same password. But I, think, I think I want to focus on the point that you made is that that particular MAC address for that device is the only device that it's the only device that they can access your and, and that virtual device can only be accessed we can easily set up the tools in our platform and it's easy for you know it's it's complicated but we we've gone this far ahead is users can only work from a known location a known time that coordinates with their schedule mm -hmm. um, there's multiple factors of authentication right. something that they have which could be a USB key um, or or a phone um, something that they know, which is their password and their username, and then another form of authentication. So when we say multiple, multi-factor multi, multi, multi uh, authentication, we're not just talking about two. Right. We try to get you to those five, you know, and potentially six factors of authentication so that we can easily say, hey, John shouldn't be working from Eastern Europe today. Um, or when John is in Eastern Europe, he doesn't have access to the formula to Coke. He can only work on the formula of Pepsi when he's over right. there. Right. So geolocation, MAC address, all that is figured in. But ultimately, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is the hospital uh, or health system or the client for any of the solutions that are re ultimately responsible for configuration of security, or do you add these are layers you automatically add on? So we, we in our platform, we give the hospital all these tools. So if we bring on a client, we ask them questions. Hey, does your billing staff need to work from home? Okay, and let's say they don't initially, but during an emergency, you put in a ticket and you easily say, this building staff can work from a specific geo, geo, geo range, right? Geo You've been 100 miles, right. let's say, right. 50 miles of right. on vacation. Has that proven to be an issue though? Let's say, you know, I'm thinking ahead here from our hospitals, boy, they have uh, folks that travel all the time, right? So I'm, I'm here in DC, literally my life from next week or the end of the week, I'm in California. How would you? How would they handle a situation like that? Like how? Yeah, I mean, so so every profile is different, right? A, a, a healthcare provider, you know, who's providing a clinician who's in the hospital, does not need access to the EMR outside of 
the physical hospital. And and unfortunately, um, a lot of a lot of systems are are built so that they're web accessible, and it's hard to lock them down sometimes mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. So you're saying ultimately, for every user, there's a profile sheet. Correct. In theory, right? For any for VDI provider, that's what they should be doing is providing a profile sheet so that it uh, as the use to make the use less cumbersome and less administratively intense, so that we're not filling out a form. Hey, I'm going to visit. I need to go to this hospital in this next state. Okay, so you can kind of manage that. Um, but I, I was thinking this again a little bit more. So we're talking about the the pre-breach security. Ultimately, again, I think is we we at the HA of course recommend that any managed service provider, especially managed service security providers, they go through rigorous uh, testing as well and whatever those cybersecurity requirements are. Because we have seen and I've published alerts that the bad guys, foreign-based, very sophisticated criminal organizations, sometimes nation-state back, will target an MSP, hoping to get access to all those all those clients and so forth within the MSP. It's, you know, I say the hub and spoke method. You're the hub, right? And um, so let me, let's talk a little bit about your own security infrastructure to protect your environment. Again, what should, you know, questions about the resilience for your uh, environment again. If you go down, if you're attacked, we unfortunately have seen many uh, third-party, mission-critical, even life-critical vendors get attacked by ransomware. So let's talk about your security as well. Yeah, our security is um, literally military grade. Um, so we are using multiple um, solutions at multiple layers, mm -hmm. and we are constantly creating additional kind of rings around our environment. Um, and hard segregation, um, there's hard segregation um, from a lot of things, I won't get into specifics, but we can assure you that there's, there's segregation at every point. And we assume, when we go to bed at night, we assume we're gonna get breached. You know, that's the way we have to operate. It's probably a safe strategy, unfortunately, right? Uh, unfortunately, that's the way you have to think, and you've gotta monitor, you know, the world for what the latest threats are. You have to understand your clients, too. Um, we think that's key. You have to understand the clients. Yeah. So, for instance, if, uh, again, any, any virtual desktop provider, if they're hosting types of hospitals, critical access hospitals, or maybe it's an academic medical research center that's on the cutting edge of genomic research or infectious disease, now you're not just attracting criminal organizations. You're attracting nation state, as we said, very sophisticated intelligence services, Chinese government, uh, no secret here, most prolific and aggressive targeting medical research. These are some of the type of folks that, again, might be coming after any virtual desktop provider. So, again, your infrastructure, could you, and without giving away too much, right, in terms of your redundancy, resiliency, and layers of security, you told us a little bit about it. Sure. So it starts at the perimeter, and we have um, um, a, a security operations center that's monitoring every internet connection in and out of our virtual desktops. Mm -hmm. So we literally log every internet connection for every user um, for a period of time. Interesting. Now, let me, uh, I've just had this thought because a lot of the smaller hospitals, in particular critical access, rural hospitals, um, unfortunately many of them I speak to say to John, we just can't afford a 24 seven SOC. Um, you know, we have our IT folks do a great job, but. They try to keep up with the logs, but they can't monitor 24-7. And I'm not sure if this is solution, but in a way, would your service be functioning as a SOC? Are you monitoring that uh, those connections as well? We do. And, and the byproduct of your virtual it, desktop. It, it is, because, you know, when we, when we put together um, what we feel is the appropriate solution, you, 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 can't, you can't think of security without thinking of productivity. Right. And, and they have to go hand in hand. Um, the other thing about the SOC, do, but we do, all of our clients sit behind our SOC. The other, the other important aspect of the SOC, and you know this, John, is if your security operations team is only monitoring 15% of the activity, it's only 15% effective. That's right. And um, it's something, but it's like locking the front door and leaving the back door in the alarm. You know, a lot of these smaller places, maybe they get up to 60 70%. But ultimately, there's a backlog that's created. We say, well, we don't monitor on the weekend or off hours. We try to catch up, but, but inevitably, the backlog just grows and grows. Or they're not monitoring um, 
the physical devices and they're monitoring email, or they're monitoring an application and they're not monitoring the application at the proper levels. So a good virtual desktop environment, really the goal should be to reduce your IT infrastructure so that your cybersecurity experts, we're providing it, if the hospital's doing it internally, if it's a third party, you're giving them a better chance to be successful. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they're walking into a situation, they're not worried that there's going to be surprises coming from every angle. Mm -hmm. We want to minimize the noise that your security team has to manage. Understood. So again, some potentially tangential benefits, not necessarily the main focus, but additional layers of security 24-7 monitoring for any, again, any virtual desktop solution should be providing that. So we, we started to talk about your own security and your own environment, again, without giving away too much. Like, where are you posted? You know, you and I had I half-joking conversations when you came into me, and I have to admit I was a bit skeptical. I said, okay, where's the server? Is it in somebody's basement, or where is this? Don't talk to me about your infrastructure. It's not under and my... And by the way, it's, uh, it's not often that... Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is about a little bit of a uh, webinar and a little bit of an interview slash interrogation. So uh, yeah. by, as folks that don't know me, they spent 30 years in the FBI, uh, before coming to the AHA. So uh, sometimes I just yeah. can't help it. Yeah. I ask the question. I appreciate that. So tell me, where is this hosted? Yeah, so we, we host the production environments. 90% of our clients' virtual desktops reside on infrastructure that we own mm -hmm. in co-locations, big, huge data centers that are geo-redundant around the country. Yeah. Um, and then you know, all the standards of the... Um, yeah, so we they are all of our data centers are in a data center terminology or SOC 2 Type 2, Tier 3 SSA 16. What does that mean to the layperson? It means that the SEC, the FBI, and many agencies are our neighbors in our data centers. So they'll host government, FedRAMP certified, like? Correct. Yeah. Yep. So government entities and yep. from, maybe, I don't know, classified, unclassified, but environments, but government, the government has approved to use the same facilities you're using uh, for their own agencies, federal government. Yep. I mean, so our, 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 yeah. our physical cages are highly protected, there's lots of cameras, there's there's many man traps to get there. Right. Um, so physical security, and physical security, um, no offense to my uh, friends in the, uh, you know, uh, response team world, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little easier than, than virtual security. That's right, of course. You, you can't, you don't, you can't see around the oh, corner. You've got 10,000 bad guys attacking you at the same yeah. time from yeah. all over the world. Yeah, a, friend, a, a mutual friend of ours, Ari Maharis, uh, says that his ultimate dream is to be able to see around the corner, right. um, you know, when he's providing in his physical security details and even in his cyber piece. And our goal, again, is to minimize that IT footprint so that we use great tools. We use AI-based engines um, at multiple levels. I won't get into specifics of which tools. But the other nice thing about, about the way we handle it, and the nice thing about te virtual desktops as a whole, not just Tetherview, is if – you have a vendor who is breached, and we've yeah. seen SolarWinds breach. We've seen yeah, right. we've seen other breaches from even anti-malware providers, mm -hmm. where we know the data has been you know exfiltrated. Um, a properly built and well engineered um, and well architected virtual desktop environment can allow you to change that tool immediately. Right. In fact, we always have three different vendors for. Um, the antivirus on the shelf tested, ready to go, mm -hmm. just in case there's a gap. Right. Um, and we're always monitoring. Right. That. So, again, you're still ultimately a remote service, that, that cloud-based remote service that the users are. So part of our concern is that, again, these attacks on these mission-critical cloud-based third providers where there is no on-prem redundancy. Uh, I won't say the name, but a very well-known timekeeping uh, service was struck uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, there was no on-prem solution. And they, you know, this, like many others, they claim 99.999 uptime capability. That's not true, because no one is bulletproof, right? Even not even the federal government. So talk to us again, if there, your redundancy, right? Whether it's a physical disaster, a virtual attack, and not just, for, again, from Ted of you, what should we, as potential clients, customers for virtual desktop solutions should be looking for? So in an ideal scenario, um, and no regulator requires this, there's no standard that says that you need to do right. this. Not yet. 
federal government's talking, but we'll see. They're talking, but I don't think it's going to be too onerous to try to do yeah. the, the, the level of backup that, that I'm, I'm going to describe here is you should have three to four layers of backup. Um, so you should have on-prem in a production environment full, almost live replication of your data. So the, obviously the hospitals should maintain their own on-prem backup, which certainly we always talk about on-prem, cloud-based. If, if the hospital has it on-prem or they're hosting with a, or if we're yeah. hosting a server with us, and mm -hmm. again, this becomes very cost prohibitive right. for a single operator to, to do, but in an ideal scenario, and, and something that we, we are modeled to, is we replicate first on-site to very fast backups. Mm -hmm. So we do that on purpose so that we can back up more frequently and we can recover faster, right? Okay. We test our backups daily. We literally test our backups daily. Um, we have reports that are very granular that tell us this backup failed, this backup didn't fail, and then we are actually doing recovery tests almost every day, hmm. uh, if not every day. Um, we, we, our, our goal is to get to continuous backup testing every day. Um, and then you back up to a secondary cold, warm, hot site. Depends on what your budget is, right. okay? But there should be a second facility where you can spin up instances That's and right. go. And then from there, you should then put your data as if you know everything is going to get obliviated. It needs to go into an uh, offline, extremely cold, worm-style backup. And that's the important part. What is worm, worm is an old term from tapes. Tapes, you know? right, because different types of media. Right? Tapes, right? right? But we, we don't back up on tape. But a worm means um, write once, read many. Mm -hmm. So you essentially back it up, and it's immutable, to use a term from that's a block tree. Key. So that's the key these days. We talk a lot about immutable storage because we have seen now from many, many ransomware case studies and attack methodology is that part of their MO, method of operation, their TTP, tactic techniques and procedures, once they penetrate an organization, the bad guys, um, they're going to do a couple of things first before they don't just automatically encrypt. The ransomware will attempt to identify the backups and head right for those backups like a cruise missile, totally. trying to encrypt those backups while they're trying to exfiltrate data, while they're trying to get credentials, escalate privilege. But the backups are key uh, because the bad guys know if they can encrypt the backups, you have no ability to independently restore, and therefore you'd be more likely to pay the ransom. So the backups are critical, and again, from, a, from your perspective, where you or any virtual desktop uh, provider, you're not serving one hospital. You're serving 100 hospitals. So really, really critical. And I think you mentioned me previously, SOC 2, Type 2 uh, certifications. Tell us a little bit about what that entails and what should hospitals be looking for any virtual desktop provider that has that. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a hot button for me. We, we discussed this, yeah. but, you know, the, um, the, the, the pet peeve I have is a lot of folks use compliance as a very generic term. Mm -hmm. And so not all compliance is the same. I, I wrote a, an article um, recently that, you know, you can be um, HIPAA compliant, yeah. okay, but you're not fully HIPAA compliant. So a piece of the puzzle is HIPAA compliant. Same thing with IT. A lot of folks look at IT and they, they're looking for, I don't want to say looking for the quick answer, but, you know, you have to look at what is covered in the attestation by the auditor. And so you can achieve a SOC 2 Type 2 for your data center, or you can go to Azure and get a certain certification, but as soon as you rack a firewall, as soon as you configure something, as soon as you change something, you essentially are starting from scratch. Mm. So I tell of you, our goal is, again, by reducing that footprint and forcing everyone into that virtual desktop, okay, um, they inherit our controls very far down the stack. Mm. So when you look at our, our SOC 2 Type 2, um, it's very comprehensive. It's not just saying your data at rest is compliant, or it's not just saying that the way you access your data center is compliant. We, we took a very high standard of the NIST 800 framework and built our environment to that, and that's what our SOC 2 attestation gets, gets mm -hmm. your clients. Is that available if anybody wants to see it? And um, you, you need to sign an NDA or, yep. or be a client, but right. it's, cer it's certainly available. Right. Um, and what ends up happening is you inherit our controls. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you don't become automatically HIPAA compliant because you inherited right. our controls. Right, because you're not technically HIPAA compliant, but you're through SOC. 
SOC 2 type 2. So we give our clients yeah. all of the controls. They inherit all of the physical aspects, um, access control, audits, mm-hmm. encryption at rest, encryption at, at, in transit. Right. Um, there's there's 137 controls that we provide our clients that they inherit from us. Right. But things that we don't do is we don't train the user right. on on appropriateness, right. appropriate use. We don't train the IT manager on um, who should have access to one piece of data or the other piece of data. Ultimately, it's the covered entity's responsibility still, just as when they contract with any cloud services, whether in you know, Azure right. yep. or Amazon, it's up to the, the client, the tenant, to configure the security controls, right? So, and, and, and again, what, what Tetherview does, it was the differentiator, is we take you further along in that journey. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when you're looking, whether it's Tetherview, virtual desktop is truly, uh, it, it is the, the best solution for uh, healthcare facilities because it allows you to hit these controls quickly. Yeah. It allows you to evolve and become productive. But when you're comparing solutions to each other, is do you have to build that, that audit server, do you have to go out and buy that monitoring tool? Do you have to go and configure it? Do you have to hire a consultant to do it? Yeah. Or are you simply putting in a ticket to your provider and saying, um, this is the profile I want to build for my um, um, nurse, my registration staff, my, my pre-surgical staff, um, and, and we work off of profiles. So when you, when you look at compliance, you really have to dig deep mm-hmm. and ask the question is, how far does it take me? How much lift is on me? to get you get get me get me further down the right. road. Right. So really interesting. And I think yeah, I think as again we between the workforce shortage, financial pressures, um, folks will be looking towards technology for solutions to help ease those pressures. Workforce, financial, it's all coming to a head, even with the ending of uh, COVID public health emergency recently that has uh, restricted some types of fundings that ho- uh, hospitals provided on provide relied on. And then um, Again, very, very concerned about the rural critical access hospitals. So, like, as it should be, right? Do you know, we, we have these hospitals that are all in these very remote areas, 25 bed, sometimes 10 bed, frontier hospitals, literally on frontier. And again, having access to remote technologies always sounds great to me, right? But I'm always concerned. I'm always concerned. What happens for a number of factors you lose that remote access? But again, it can be a an enhancer, a force multiplier for security and for clinical efficiency. So again, I think I was saying this all sounds great, Mike, right? And you know, again, I'm representing the nation's hospitals. I'm not representing you. This is not an endorsement in any type. And you know, for even for you to be in this chair today, it took some work. And that first, I was very skeptical in a sense. I, you know, you're a great friend and so forth, but again, I represent the hospitals. So it sounds great. So now how can you prove to me and prove to us that this works? How will you show us yeah. that this works? Yes, thanks, thank you for the opportunity. And, and you know, I, I, I have been in those frontier hospitals. I, I, I've been in a hospital where a farmer literally said, I need to build a hospital here so my, 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 my employees. Next nearest emergency department, right, there's 25 right. miles. People depend on those hospitals. That, that, that the worst cases I, I've seen when these hospitals get hit with a ransomware attack, the next nearest, said, John, our next nearest emergency department is 100 miles away. If we can get a medevac, if the weather's good, we might be able to save a patient that comes in there, stroke, heart attack, or trauma. So we're very concerned there. So, again, tell us, yeah. how can you prove to me yeah. and the field that this is a viable solution? Yeah, so what we're offering um, the AHA uh, is a proof of concept of 100 desktops per hospital, and we're going to give it away for free. Um, we're going to give um, uh, up to six hospitals, 100 desktops each, virtual desktops, virtual desktops that are configured by us. You moving to a virtual desktop in the situation that we're proposing, it's like changing a laptop. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be very simple. So instead of handing an employee a laptop, you're going to give them credentials to a virtual desktop that can access from anywhere. And they're going to keep using their EMR systems. We're going to connect back to their existing systems. So the way you treat a physical laptop is the way we're going to initially roll out this proof of concept. So to answer your question, John, we, we don't want you to trust us, right? We want you to look at our audit. We want you to rip that apart. We want all of our clients to review the audit. We yes. wish they did ahead of time. We wish they compared us to other solutions. But we also are going to offer this proof of concept um, for any hospital in the American Hospital yes. Association um, to take advantage of. So what's the cost? What's, where's, where's the uh, 
what's the uh, hook here? Like, how much does it cost? Is there a setup charge? Is there a disconnection fee? Is there tell us? No, nope, there's no hooks. There's literally no hooks. So we we have a no grumpy customer policy for yeah. our, our standard. And no grumpy John Rigi policy. No, I, know, I do right. not want John Rigi <laughs> grumpy. Believe me, guys, we do not want that. Um, that would not be a good thing. Um, but what we're what we're offering is literally three months, six months for free. Um, there's no yeah, setup fee. Change it. Three to six months. No, no, no. Six months, six months, six okay. months free. It's right. always been six months uh, yeah. because there's a setup time. It yeah, takes yeah. adoption. Right. These, these, these technologies always need adoption. Um, we want to build champions. We want to be able to proliferate it around the organization. But in six months free, there's no setup, no, no setup fee. There's no implementation fee, and there's no disconnected. Disconnect fee. There's no uh, bottom line. There's no requirement to like, hey, you got to sign this contract. There's no requirement. Free for six months. We have to sign BA agreements, business yeah. associate agreements. Um, we have to go through uh, the normal kind of. You're gonna you're gonna treat us as if we're a vendor. We're not gonna allow you just to do this. There's no six. In other words, there's no commitment beyond. There's no the six commitment months. beyond the six months. Okay, folks, you heard it here. Yeah. No commitment, no fee. Um, so, Michael, how does if we have six? It's, you're offering this for six hospitals, right? Six Correct. hospitals, 100 up to 100 virtual desktops for a hospital. How do they sign up for this? Because folks, actually, you're doing an experiment, also a proof of concept for the American Hospital Association. It all sounds great, but we want to see it. We want the references uh, for Michael. Um, you know, I like Michael and have a drink with him or a coffee, but to continue on the relationship to be positioned with the AHA, we want to see the proof. And so we appreciate you offering the proof of concept. But how do we? How does a hospital sign up for this? Just email uh, myself, um, or we'll put up uh, contact information, and we'll we'll get right back to you. Visit tetherview.com um, slash AHA com slash AHA, and you'll be able to um, access the, uh, okay. the the proof of concept and sign up for it. Great. And then as part of the program is that they'll be reviewed by me at AHA, and we'll speak to anybody that does sign up. We want your independent assessment. So this is a very different. We're not just asking folks to take um, a, a vendor's word here. They have to prove it to us, and then I'll be in touch directly and uh, as well to confirm results, positive or negative. From the groups, sounds like a great opportunity. And folks, also, if you do sign up there, please email myself as well. It's J R I G G I G G I at a h a dot org. J R I G G I G G I at a h a dot org. And ultimately, so we appreciate you being that because when I said to you, I said, Michael, this all sounds great. I hear, you know, ten presentations a week. I stop listening to folks. I said, we've got to prove it. We want the references. We want the proof of concept. So I commend you for taking that step forward. And say, John, you don't have to believe me. We'll prove it. So let's see if we have any questions here. Um, let's see here. I'm going to expand out a little bit. And let's see if we've got any folks here. I don't see any questions right now, but I think we'll put in the chat here uh, for everybody to see my email again, J-R-I-G-G-I at aha.org, and let's see. And Michael, what else would you like to tell us here in a few remaining, again, to give advice on just a very general solution here if they were looking for this type of solution regardless? Now, I think, I think the, um, the key to technology going forward is avoiding some costs. And it's important that when you're evaluating a, a, any technology, that you can evolve in or out of it. Um, you have access to your data all the time, and you're not vendor locked. Um, so it's really, really, really important that 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 that, that you're taking that on into account. Great, folks. I, I realize that the camera. We've got a spotty connection here uh, as well, so it's been in and out a little bit. So, folks, again, uh, I think we do have one question up here. Uh, question is from John out there. How do you connect your VDI? To an on-prem EMR and maintain performance. Yeah, um, it's a great question. So um, today, your your EMR is probably connected over a VPN, um, and it's probably connected on a client-side VPN. So your physical laptop has to connect to the EMR. Um, with a good virtual desktop solution, the way Tetherview does it, it's what we call a technical term top of rack to top of rack connection. So you're getting an enterprise grade connection from your EMR on-prem to our enterprise-grade um, firewall, 
And instead of having multiple hundreds or thousands of connections to your EMR, there's literally just a single connection. Mm. And that single connection is happening over 14 plus ISPs, mm. extremely redundant, um, and, and, and it just adds reliability and connectivity to your EMR. So it, it speaks to the resiliency that you were asking about, John. Well, great. We appreciate that again, uh, Michael, and we hope to get uh, six. You're offering, I think that is a very generous offer to prove it. We don't get many of our uh, partners or vendors that come to us and just say, hey, John, we'll, we'll put a proof of concept. They always have. You might have some great references here or there, but to actually see it in action for us to be able to independently review, I think, is will be a really unique opportunity. So I think that we're going to wind up here, folks. Uh, unless there's any further questions, you can also just send any further questions, again, to us here at AHA or to Michael directly and to answer any of those. Michael, any final closing thoughts before I move on here? You know, I just want to, want to close with, again, um, the, the, the goal of IT needs to align with, with an organization. And, um, uh, you know, a, a healthcare organization is better patient outcomes. And your vendors need to just be entrenched in healthcare. I've been in healthcare for 20 plus years. I understand the challenges and, and, and I've been part on patient delivery side of it. So I appreciate that. Um, and the other aspect of technology that's a challenge is it's evolving. The only thing constant here is change. Right. Um, whether it's a the Cybersecurity Act that's coming up um, or the cyber threats that are out there, um, you can't go into solutions that, that hamstring you and don't allow you to evolve quickly. Exactly. So again, thank you, Michael, for being here today. We look forward to hopefully uh, being having the opportunity to review some of these proof of concepts. And thank you to everybody for tuning in today. That does conclude today's discussion. And uh, thanks to each of you for participation today. And as you're signing off, you'll see a survey. We'd certainly appreciate you sharing your perspectives and feedback as your input provides us with ideas for future programs. Also, shortly after today's event concludes, you'll receive an email with links for both the webinar play, replay and the presentation download. Feel free to share both with other interested folks throughout your organizations. This has been John Regi, your National Advisor for Cybersecurity and Risk with Michael Abood, and we hope that you all stay safe out there and thank you for what you do every day care for our patients, and serve our communities. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's presentation. You may now disconnect.